Okay, good morning. Let's get started. Any questions? Questions? So as you may have noticed uh, on uh, the Quarkus page of our lecture section, I'm posting every week a summary of what I have covered and uh, the uh, correspondence of the topics that we cover in the lectures with the textbook chapters. And uh, if you uh, check this uh, correspondence, you will see that uh, indeed we have covered everything that um, is included in the quiz. And therefore, my goal this week is to review concepts that we have seen uh, so that you uh, are well prepared on uh, Thursday evening uh, for the midterm. Uh, so for the midterm, not the quiz. For the midterm. Uh, so I would like to start from the end, which is capacitance, resistance, energy that we have seen in the previous week. Uh, remember that in general, a capacitor would be a combination of two conductors. So we have a first conductor here, second conductor. These are separated by a dielectric, and the dielectric has a, a specific goal to isolate the conductors. So epsilon being the dielectric uh, permittivity of the dielectric. Typically, we would charge these conductors. Uh, and uh, if you imagine the system as electrically neutral, I actually have here a capacitor. It's a cylindrical uh, capacitor, as you will see. And I will, my first example will be on a cylindrical capacitor uh, like this. Uh, so we start from an electrically neutral system. Then we have a voltage source. I have here a battery. And uh, we charge through the battery. The first conductor with charge plus Q and the other with minus Q. And it suffices to have just one contact point here to enforce the potential on the two conductors Y. Anybody remembers? Why do I need just one contact point to uh, define the potential on the entire conductor? Yes. The potential is path independent, but uh, why do I need just one contact point to force, let's say, uh, this is, uh, let's say that I have here, I believe this is uh, something like a 10 volt uh, source. And uh, I use one contact, contact point to put this to 10 volts and one contact point to put this to zero volts. So why do I need just one contact point and I'm sure that the entire conductor is 10 volts and zero volts respectively? Yes? Because the conductors are equipotential surfaces. This is uh, very important about conductors. They are equipotential surfaces and that should be very natural to you. I mean, right now we're rephrasing or we're putting in the perspective of a more, a more rigorous physical theory thinks that you have seen time and again. When you draw a circuit like this, you put a voltage source and a resistor and so on. You don't question whether the voltage here is the same as voltage here. here. You take it for granted. You take it for granted. If you use spice, you put here a node, and that node represents the potential throughout the wire. Why? Because the wire is a conductor, and hence it is an equipotential surface. So I need just one contact point in order to set the potential there. And once I have set the potential, then I'm, an electric field is formed like this. The electric field has to point perpendicular to the conductors because the conductors are equipotential. We have seen two perspectives on this. The pot the Conductor is an equipotential surface. Electric fields are normal to equipotentials anyway. Second perspective is that the tangential electric field component at an interface between two materials is continuous. Continuous. You have a, a wire like this. The electric field to the left of the wire, to the right of the wire is the same. Tangential to the wire, you have exactly the same electric field. That means that the tangential component inside and outside the conductor here has to be the same. But inside the conductor, the field is zero. 
Therefore, the tangential field outside has also to be zero because of this continuity. So it's a matter of boundary conditions. It's a matter, you can see it, all these concepts are connected. So the point is that because this tangential has to be continuous and inside it is zero, we know the electric field inside a perfect conductor is zero, then outside it has to be zero and hence this does not exist. You can only have a normal component at the, of the electric field at the conductor. So this is a concept that really helps when you are trying to understand what is the structure of the field, what kinds of fields do I have. So those field lines will start from positive charges, will sink onto negative charges, and then uh, and, and, uh, and will do so at 90 degrees. And we define as capacitance this uh, ratio of charge divided by potential. And this charge we can find from Gauss's law applied on a closed surface that encloses, let's say, the first conductor. So I can define any closed surface S the electric flux integral d dot ds where d is electri dielectric permittivity times electric field will give me the charge. That is Gauss's law divided by the potential which is plus minus e dot dl. So plus, so that uh, potential starts from a positive conductor and goes to the negative conductor. So this is the capacitance and you see the electric field is on the uh, top and the bottom. So if you imagine doubling the charge from Gauss's law, that means you double the electric field. But if you double the electric field, then from this definition of the voltage, you also double the potential. And therefore, the ratio Q over V remains constant, and that is why the capacitance is a relevant quantity that does not depend on the electric field. Yeah, those uh, this uh, ratio remains a constant under changes in the electric field, and that is why capacitance is a thing. And we can buy a, a 10 picofarad capacitor without caring whether we uh, actually connect it to, sorry, this battery, which is a 6 volt battery, or, or, or to a 10 volt battery, or to 1.5 volt battery. The capacitance remains the same. Now, if we have some conductivity through this dielectric medium, some conductivity sigma, then we would also have a resistance. Why? Because if conductivity sigma wasn't zero and we have now an imperfect dielectric, that happens. You buy a dielectric, then it has some impurities. That is a small amount of free charge that under the influence of the external field, it can move. And when it moves, it gives rise to a current. Okay, so in that case, this can also act as a resistor. And then the resistance here would be V over I. V is the same V as the one above. And I, the current, can be found through the flux of the electric current density, J dot ds, in a similar surface as this one, uh, from Ohm's law that we uh, saw, this version of Ohm's law for fields, J is sigma E dot ds. So you see we have a very, very similar form of the formulas that give us the capacitance and the resistance. And in fact, if the medium is uniform, that is, if epsilon and sigma are constant, if epsilon and sigma are constant, I had started here my example, so I will just uh, go down here and continue with the concepts before I do the example. So if I was in a medium with constant epsilon and sigma, that won't be the case in my uh, example here because I want to introduce a case where 
the uh, dielectric permittivity changes uh, with, uh, with angle, but in the case that epsilon and sigma are constant, then they can come out of the integral of the two integrals. So you see sig uh, the capacitance becomes epsilon The resistance becomes this. Okay. And then if you multiply R times C you find out that these two these two integrals cancel. And then you have epsilon divided by sigma as this product. So anybody has seen this RC product before? No? I bet that you have. I bet you have since high school. It's the timing constant for the charge and the discharge of a capacitor. Uh, in fact, if you uh, do this experiment, I mean, I'm sure you did this in high school, not even university, okay, that you uh, close uh, the switch at uh, t equal zero, the voltage here at the capacitor, This is the charging phase. The voltage at the capacitor raises to V0 the voltage of the voltage source with a time constant RC. So this calculation shows you that this time constant is actually tied to that this time constant is tied to the materials, to the conductivity and the permittivity of the materials. We use also the capacitors for energy storage. I have here a very simple experiment where uh, I am charging this capacitor. If I discharge it, then you see it discharges through the light bulb. In fact, the charging and the discharging are actually pretty fast. So the capacitor actually acts as a secondary battery. I charge it through the battery, and then when I disconnect uh, the capacitor from the battery connected to the uh, light bulb, uh, it actually gives me uh, this uh, energy that is needed to turn on the, the light bulb. Uh, and uh, we can find, so this is... Uh, Basically, the energy that is stored in the electric field corresponds to the, can be found through the volume energy density, WE, which is one half epsilon E squared. So once I find the electric field, I can find how much energy I have stored in the electric field in the capacitor with this formula that I is uh, joules per meter cubed. So in order to find the energy that has been stored in the capacitor, I need to integrate it over the entire volume of the capacitor, as I will show in a little bit. Um, and we have, in the case of the conductivity, also power dissipated. And the volume density of dissipated power in the presence of um, uh, in the presence of some conductivity this is what we call This is what we call uh, ohmic power. 
what is this the power that is dissipated in wires and converts is converted to heat that's why uh, wires heat up when there is a current that can be found the again the uh, power density as sigma e squared sigma conductivity times electric field squared so you see the electric field squared is there in both cases so here is an example where all these concepts will come together uh, it is a similar capacitor to this one a similar capacitor to this one so if uh, I give you a different perspective two cylinders cylinder uh, of uh, radius A cylinder of radius B these have a length of uh, let's say L so this is what we have compared to previous examples that we have seen with the coaxial cables the only difference here is that I have put a dielectric in between that breaks the radial symmetry it is a dielectric that has a dependence on the phi coordinate so overall I have a cylindrical problem cylinders two cylinders but now I have a phi dependence on the dielectric permittivity so this is the expression I'm using a voltage source to charge the, uh, the, the, conduct, the capacitor, the conductors and uh, that means that uh, I'm setting the potential in the first conductor to V0 and the potential in the second conductor to zero so imagine that the second conductor is just grounded so I can set the potential there to zero so the first question here is that assuming assuming that V is only a function of the radial coordinate find the electric flux density in the area between the conductors Uh, so here's a question can we apply Gauss's law here to find that electric flux density how many say yes how many say no okay so we have actually a tie um, but the answer here is really no because we don't have any radial symmetry the radial symmetry has been broken by the dielectric permittivity so if you go back to this summary page that I have for our lecture section you will see that I have posted a handout and says that if you have problems where everything depends on R you can assume that the electric field and D is a function of R dr of R R hat and then apply Gauss's law on a cylinder if you have problems with spherical symmetry where everything depends on capital R the radial coordinate of the spherical coordinate system you can right away assume that the electric field and the D vector depend only on capital R and apply Gauss's law on uh, a sphere to determine that that uh, capital that uh, electric field here we have a cylindrical problem that breaks uh, the symmetry through the dielectric permittivity so in this case now I can use the Laplace equation because it tells me it gives me the problem gives me some guidance about the potential and also I have the boundary conditions so knowing that uh, the potential is a function of R and the boundary conditions I can find the potential from the 
we will see Poisson or Laplace equation Now we have to be a bit careful about uh, the next step because we don't have here the second condition for the Laplace equation. You, the Poisson equation reduces to Laplace when you have constant epsilon and no volume charge density. Here we have, so let me make a note that Poisson equation reduces to Laplace under two conditions. Rho V has to be equal to zero, no volume charge density, and the second condition is epsilon a constant. So here we satisfy the first, but we don't satisfy the second. So I have to go and write the uh, full form of the Poisson equation. which is that the divergence of epsilon gradient of the potential. And I'm just writing out the operators, divergence and gradient, because many times I find that people get confused with the dels, because there is a del for the gradient, there is a del for the divergence. And then sometimes you go to the H sheet and you mix up which one to use. Just to clarify the divergence, is applied to a vector and gives you a scalar. The gradient is applied to a scalar and gives you a vector. So therefore, it should be obvious which one is which. If you apply your operator to a scalar function, like here, it has to be a gradient. Uh, so if you apply it to a vector, it has to be the divergence. But in any case, the uh, Poisson equation is this one. Here, we don't have any volume charge density. Therefore, the right-hand side is 0. But I still have to be careful about the left-hand side and epsilon now not, um, uh, uh, not being a constant. So it has a certain uh, functional dependence. So I take it uh, step by step. The gradient of V which depends only on R because uh, V is given to depend only on the radial coordinate, uh, the gradient has just one component. So the gradient will be R hat dV over dr. And then we have uh, the second part, which is the divergence of uh, epsilon alpha plus epsilon B cosine squared phi. R hat. Uh, so here we have the divergence of a vector that has just one uh, single uh, component. So this actually has only one term, and that one term is 1 over r d over dr of um, r times the component so this is it so you take the r component you multiply it by r you take the uh, d over dr and you have a 1 over r on the front so this is the divergence so that one now completes the left-hand side. The right-hand side is equal to 0. Uh, the 1 over r that is on the front will, won't make any difference. So therefore, I have to integrate this equation. In order to find the potential, we'll do that. The first step is relatively simple. So d by, d of, d by dr of this has to be equal to 0. That means that whatever is in the brackets has to be equal to a constant. That is the first constant. I will call it C1. I will keep my concepts there. 
And uh, then I have that uh, epsilon alpha plus epsilon b cosine square phi dv over dr is equal to c1 over r. Okay. In fact, uh, this is by itself an, in an important uh, equation. And then I integrate this once more. That gives me uh, that uh, the integral of 1 over r is the logarithm. And then I have one more constant. So I don't forget the constants. I will determine them from the boundary conditions. Okay. Any questions up to this point? Any questions? So you see some uh, note here about a case that uh, we haven't really encountered in those uh, simple examples that we went through. Uh, but still, on a step-by-step -step, uh, basis, uh, we can uh, deal with this. Questions? Okay, so now I have to find those two constants, C1 and uh, C2. In fact, I can call this one, uh, maybe I will just leave it there. I, I could call it a third constant, but it's okay. So the boundary conditions now. are that uh, the potential at r equals a is v naught. So c1 by epsilon alpha plus epsilon b cosine squared phi logarithm of a plus c2 is equal to v naught. And then uh, the potential at the second conductor is zero. So that means c1 epsilon alpha plus epsilon b cosine squared phi uh, logarithm of uh, b plus c2 is equal to 0. So if you uh, subtract those two equations, if you subtract the two equations, you find that c1 epsilon alpha plus epsilon b cosine square phi ln a minus ln b is equal to v naught. This one I can write ln a over b or if you wish minus ln b over a just so that um, uh, I write the logarithm of uh, a bigger radius to a smaller radius. Uh, the LMB over A is a positive number with minus a negative. So then C1 is uh, minus V naught divided by ln B over A times this uh, constant epsilon alpha. Constant in terms of, I mean, it doesn't depend on. So then we have that uh, C2 is uh, V naught uh, minus uh, C uh, minus ln A divided by epsilon alpha plus epsilon B cosine squared phi times C1 and that uh, C1 is minus V naught ln B over A epsilon alpha plus epsilon b cosine squared phi. So uh, these two cancel out. And then uh, that means that uh, C2 is uh, v naught um, 
1 plus ln a divided by ln b over a. And I can take one more step here. Let me just uh, b over a ln b minus ln a plus ln a. Too many logarithms, but we have finally b over a. Okay, so this is now the two constants. And at this point, we have the potential. Um, all right, uh, any questions up to this point? Yes. Uh, well, we determine them from the boundary conditions. Yeah. Constant with respect to, to R. Uh, because it multiplies the bracket and that uh, total gives you to zero. Yeah, so that is, that is why. All right, so any other questions? Uh, so now the electric, uh, the electric field, in fact, I don't exactly need the potential because the question asks me about basically the electric field. Uh, so so if you uh, uh, if you have the potential, you can find the electric field from E equals minus gradient of uh, minus gradient of V. The electric field is equal to minus gradient of V. V depends only on R, so it is equal to minus R hat dV over dr. This is something we said also in the previous lecture. That is, I don't need to go back and put the potential together, find C1. In fact, if I was in an exam and I wanted to save time, I didn't even need to find C2 because what I need here to calculate the electric field is right here. So I only need it actually in principle, this C1. C1, which is V0 logarithm of ln B over A, divided by phi r. So this is, in fact, uh, what I uh, needed to, to find, dv over dr. Uh, let me see if I have uh, the right answer here. Uh, sorry, uh, C1 is uh, V0 LMB times this, sorry. So I saw in the symmetry that something was going wrong. So then these two cancel out and the electric field is minus R uh, V0. Uh, and in fact, we have another minus, right, from here. So minus, minus, that gives me plus R hat V0 uh, LN B over A. R. So this is, in fact, my electric field. So you see, I made a mistake with the signs. I uh, forgot, I uh, missed the, my, the second minus. But I knew that my electric field had to point outwards. The electric field had to point outwards. Why? Because, first of all, the electric field points from the positive charges to negative charges. And I know that this one uh, has been charged like this. So here I have the positive charge. 
here I have the negative charge. And also, I know a second thing, that the electric field has to always point in the direction of decreasing potential. So it has to point from the inner conductor that has the high potential to the lower conductor that has the low potential, to the outer conductor that has the low potential. And therefore, although I missed the sign, I was able to realize that there was a mistake there and uh, recover uh, this mistake, and, uh, so, and uh, sorry, uh, correct the mistake. So it has to be this. And finally, I can find D from epsilon times electric field. And you see that now this one won't be symmetric. It will still be in the radial direction, but it will have both the phi dependence and the radial dependence. So this is what uh, is the electric flux density in the, which was uh, the original question, as you see over there, in the space in between the two conductors. Okay, so this was the first part. Uh, and uh, the second part is asking for the capacitance. So second part, find the capacitance. Find the capacitance C of this capacitor over length L. So how can we find the capacitance? Because the capacitance Q over V is a constant ratio, remember what we said. We can either set Q and find V or set V and find Q. In this case, we have already set the voltage. In the first, in fact, the problem by itself sets the voltage. So we are in the second situation where the voltage has been set and all we need to do is find the charge. So we need to find the charge in one of the two conductors, whichever we like. Me, do I have spare space here? Let me just... So already the uh, voltage here has been set. So to find C, we only need to determine Q. So we just need to determine the charge on any of the two conductors. It's uh, just a matter of uh, preference. I will do it for the inner conductor. Uh, but I could have done it for the outer conductor. So the inner cylinder. So this is the inner cylinder. This uh, clearly has been charged with uh, the positive pole of my battery. So how can I find the charge there? Any ideas? Yes, please. Right, so we have to go and apply the boundary condition, first of all, at R equals A. At R equals A, we have the interface between the conductor and the dielectric. So this is the conductor, this is the dielectric. I draw the normal unit vector at the interface which is nothing else but the radial unit vector. This is, a con this is a cylinder, so therefore the normal unit vector on the cylinder is R hat. This is it. So we apply the boundary condition that says that N, N hat dot D2 minus D1 
is equal to surface charge density at the interface. Here I have one of the two special cases, an interface between a dielectric and a conductor. So inside the conductor, the electric, which is assumed to be a perfect conductor, the electric field is zero and hence D1 will also be zero. And therefore, this is an equation that directly allows me to use the result from the first part to find the surface charge density on the surface. So Rosa Bess at the boundary, this is a boundary condition, so I'm talking about the surface charge density on the cylinder is r hat dot the electric flux density at the cylinder. So this r that I have there, I will have to replace it by the value at the interface. So this is a boundary condition. And boundary condition means that I have to take this field and evaluate it at the boundary, which is R equals A. It is the cylinder. So this is all I have. R dot R is equal to 1. Uh, I have the V naught there as well. So I find the surface charge density at the cylinder which is V naught epsilon A plus epsilon B cosine squared phi divided by A times logarithm of B over A. So this is a phi dependent surface charge density. So that one now I have to integrate to find the charge. So that is how much I have as a charge density. To find the total charge, I need to integrate it over the cylinder. Okay. So I need basically to go at all these differentially small surface elements, ds on the cylinder, and find how much charge I carry, and then through the integration, add them all up. Now, if you go to your age sheet and you look for differential surface elements in the cylindrical coordinates, you will see three of them. You will see an R hat, R d phi dz, you will see a phi hat uh, dr dz, and you will see a z hat r d phi dr. Okay. So these are uh, vectors. These are vectors. Here we don't have a vector. We have a ds because we are integrating over a surface. So we are looking for one of those three as the candidate. Because I'm on the cylinder, R is fixed. Therefore, none of those that include dr can be the one that I need to use. R is fixed. I am on the cylinder, and therefore, I have to go with this one. And one more thing I have to think is, because I'm on the cylinder, R is not a variable anymore. It's fixed. It's A. So therefore, what I put in here, will be A d phi dz. So if you want to see this geometrically, from this patch, if this is d phi, this arc length here is A d phi. It's on the cylinder. And then I need to move also longitudinally by dz. So this is my area where I will find uh, my dq and then dq by dq, I will add them up through the integration to find the total charge on the cylinder. I cannot push it anymore. So uh, this is my result. Q will be 
the surface charge density I integrate obviously with respect to d phi and dz phi and z so my bounds are from 0 to 2 pi and uh, from 0 to L uh, the surface charge density is uh, V naught uh, sorry let me just confirm V naught epsilon alpha plus epsilon B cosine squared phi times A and then I have the uh, ds which is uh, a d phi dz so you see the a's here will cancel out and I have constants v naught and ln b over a square phi d phi and then another so this is uh, a little bit more complicated integral this is uh, from 0 to L dz is very simple will give me just L so uh, I do this separately this uh, 0 to 2 pi epsilon alpha plus epsilon b cosine squared phi d phi that has two parts This gives me 2 pi epsilon alpha. And uh, this second one the integral of cosine squared phi from 0 to pi gives me pi. So that will be pi epsilon b. So finally, my charge will be the constants, the V naught by ln B over A, the length L times what came out of uh, this integration, which is 2 pi epsilon alpha plus pi epsilon B. So finally, capacitance is Q over V. You see, this is typical that the capacitance will pop out of the expression. So Q depends on V, you just divide V out, and you have the capacitance, which is this uh, 2 pi epsilon alpha plus pi epsilon B times L divided by ln of B over A. One last uh, check here, dimensional check will be that um, epsilon is, permit is permittivity, it's given in farads per meter, L is length, gi is given in meters, farad per meter times meter, the dimensions check out, so it is uh, farad. So indeed I have found a capacitance. Um, maybe one uh, last note here in this example just to cover the place where we started from today which is uh, energy I have it up there uh, just uh, very quickly this capacitor has stored some electrostatic energy with energy density one half epsilon now epsilon is not a constant times electric field squared the electric field is right here so it's V naught squared logarithm of B over A squared R squared so the total energy can be found by integrating this over the volume of the capacitor. Of
over the volume of the capacitor. And now if you go to your age sheet and you look for differential volume elements in, uh, sphere, in uh, cylindrical coordinates, you will find that the corresponding dv here is r d phi dr dz. r square and r here cancel out. And let me just give you one more hint here. v naught squared, uh, so I have this LMB over a squared here, the one half. So I'm taking out whatever is a constant. I'm taking out the constants. Then I have inside this integral that we have done before. I have another one on dr, that is now dr over r from a to b, and I have this dz. Okay. So now this guy will give me lmb over a, this guy will, will give me l, and this will give me, as we saw before, 2 pi epsilon a plus pi epsilon b. Okay. So you can put everything together and you will see that the resulting expression is one half the logarithms will cancel out times L so the total energy stored is this energy in a capacitor is one half C V squared so this is again the capacitance C. so this is an alternative way to find the capacitance a third one so first one, you set Q and you find V. Second one, you set V and you find Q. Third one, you take the field, if that is available, you find the total energy that is stored, and then you say, okay, this has to be now one half CV squared. And then you find the capacitance. So all these three methods are consistent, uh, obviously, with, with each other. So I will stop here. I will stick around for any questions. Uh, I have announced office hours, so I hope that with these reviews that we will do in uh, this week's lectures, the office hours, the notes, whatever else, if you have questions, if the office hours don't work for you, you have questions, please email them to me. I have also posted a Slido page, an event where you can enter questions and I can project them on the screen and answer them in the lectures. So all these uh, ways to review the material. What is most important here is that Magnetism will be very easy if you know electricity. The concepts are dual, and therefore it is important that we learn the first part well so that we can cruise to the second part. Thank you.